Today's reading is Acts chapter 15, chapters 1 through 21. The Council at Jerusalem. Certain people came down from Judea and Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told the Gentiles have been converted. The news made them, all believers, very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and, re and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from your lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows you, the heart, showed and accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you treat why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is, our, it is believed through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders of God and has done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James broke, spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may see the Lord, even all Gentiles who bear my name, say, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immortality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I guess now it's time to have our pastor. Morning, friends. It's good to be in worship with you. Uh, I had this vacation scheduled way back in, uh, way back in uh, last summer. <laughs> so that's why I'm not physically with you this morning. Although uh, uh, we wish we could have, but we've uh, we still had plans, even though I've uh, bummed up my foot and we've made some other things. But uh, last Sunday was my last Sunday physically with you. And I was remiss in saying a couple things that I had intended to say, uh, but with... Uh, my brain was moving faster in my mouth or my mouth was moving faster in my brain, one or the other. But I forgot to take a moment and give thanks to a couple of people specifically that I just want to take a quick hot moment and do that now. And uh, I want to say thanks to Sylvie uh, for being in the foxhole with me in musical worship over the last few months. I've really enjoyed the opportunity of getting to know her and uh, help lead in worship with you. She is a uh, fine singer and uh, guitarist, and I've really enjoyed all the time that we've had uh, picking music together out and working together and practicing and, uh, and then also leading worship with you. It's been a lot of fun, and I wanted to give you thanks. I also wanted to thank uh, Terry Marr as well for your service to helping our young people. Um, 
And uh, you do that without a whole lot of accolade. And, and we have thought you, and thanked you when you were not in the room. But I just wanted to thank you for all that you do for our children and uh, the opportunity that you have to uh, lead them and pour into them and give you thanks for that as well. I uh, want to thank the Cranes for frequently being there uh, during uh, the greeting time and passing out bulletins. And uh, thank you for doing that in your service. There's a, a number of you who are also involved in uh, ushers and, and helping with uh, our prayer time as well. Uh, thank you for all of your service. I want to thank Matt Schrader for all his work in the AV booth. Uh, he is there every Sunday and uh, appreciate all that he has done to help us also in worship. And I want to give thanks to our liturgists. Uh, that is a very special team that our church has. Not all churches have that. And honestly, a lot of pastors kind of push those people out the door. And I think that's kind of a disservice. And I think that's something special about Edna. So I'm thankful for all those ladies who help uh, read the scripture and help lead us in worship with prayer. And uh, I'm excited to see what Pastor Jonathan has in store for you guys in the future as well. So I want to give you thanks. And I know there's lots of other people that I could thank as well, but I am so thankful for all of you and your service to your church, your local church. Um, there's just not enough salary to go around for everybody, right? So there's another jewel in your crown uh, for your service, for giving to your church. And so, so thankful for all of you and all you do to help make at a UMC uh, be a church that's welcoming and engaging and uh, so friendly. And so uh, my wife and I, as we drove away last Sunday, well, it was actually just yesterday for me, uh, we commented that you know, just one of the friendliest churches that we've ever been a part of. And so we we're we we're thankful to be in service with you. And uh, so we'll be thinking and praying of you frequently and often. And uh, we know that you'll be doing the same for us because you said the same thing on the way out the door. So that really touched our hearts. And we're so thankful for that. So this morning for you, what I have is part two from the message that I started uh, last Sunday, which was yesterday for me. Uh, six days ago for you, and uh, or seven days ago for you. And uh, what we're doing is we're taking a look at chapter Acts 15. You just had Acts 15 verses 1 through 21 read to you again, which is the same thing you heard last week. Um, but I want to dive down into the second half of this boxing match. I, I shared with you on Sunday that that felt like this was a boxing match that was happening uh, between the Pharisees and between this new upcrop of, of uh, uh, new followers of Jesus Christ who are just on fire and they're so excited. And they're, they're trying to figure out how do we help people become Christ followers? And what's, what, are, what are all the pieces that we do to this? And what's the most important thing? Or how do, how do we make sure that we don't become gatekeepers? And so that's what I left us with last Sunday. Uh, that was round one, was the Pharisees were playing the role of gatekeepers to who can get into the faith. Now, these Pharisees that we were talking about here from Acts chapter 15 in particular, though, these were Christian Pharisees. These were Christians who were still following, uh, they were still uh, really connected to the 613 laws of the Old Testament. You know, that's their, that's their main focus, is how do we do this right? How do we do this God thing? And now we've introduced this Jesus part into the story, and maybe a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Maybe they've experienced that, or maybe they've heard what's already happened in the early church, so they, they get the Holy Spirit part. But they're more about, what are the things that I do and don't do that keep me in a righteous relationship with God? Rather than Jesus made it clear that we were called to be in a righteous relationship with him. And then there, there are things that we obviously are, are drawn to that we should and shouldn't do, um, but not so hard heartened about the, the law that, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. So there's a new covenant. So round one was all about, do you have to become culturally Jewish to obey the laws to be saved? And we talked about there was a potential circumcision party Mm, that that we didn't want to have to partake in if we wanted to become Christ followers. And so now we're on round two of this whole uh, this fight that's taking place in the early church. And and uh, not to dramatize it too much, but it, it's, it, is a, it is a conflict that has to be resolved. And uh, the early church is going to have to figure out pieces of this. Or they're going to have to figure out that, hey, we can still do faith separately and love and care for one another without having to have this, we're all unanimous about all things because that's why we have 
Well, that's why we have Map Baptists. That's why we have non-denominational. That's why we have Episcopalian. That's why we have, you know, all, all the denominations and non-denominations uh, across the globe. Is because we agree that Jesus is the Son of Jesus Christ that He died for our sins. But then there's little nuances and little changes to things that that sometimes become a little more important than maybe they should be, or maybe they are important and uh, other people minimize them. I I, I don't know. It depends on what denomination or what issue or what century we're even talking about necessarily. But round two today, what we're taking a look is we are not saved by cultural identity. So it's not us being this Middle Eastern faith of Christianity. It's by, or, or by the works, but it's by God's grace. It is only by God's grace that, we're, that we are saved. And so Peter gets up and recounts how God used him to share the gospel with non-Jews. And, and we've already heard those stories through this sermon series on, okay, Jesus, now what? Taking a look at the stories of Acts and particular, particularly about uh, Peter himself. But he, he proved that he uh, accepted the Gentiles and that God poured out intentionally. This was not an accident. This was all determined, right? God poured his Holy Spirit out on them. This happened in Acts chapter 10. This happened again and again to Peter where he has this interaction and he's having these interactions in with Gentiles intentionally where God is guiding him and directing him to call these people to be in faith. And so he cleanses their hearts through, through faith and not cultural identity, right? Not through any works, not that he did anything particular. He didn't go on a mission trip someplace and come back and Jesus said, okay, now you receive grace. Now, now, now you get it. You know, the holy hands will now be laid upon you because you did fill in the box. You checked the mark. You did the thing. You, get, you wrote a check to make a difference in this impoverished country. And now, now I'll make it official, but don't screw up. <laughs> like that's, 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 not, that's not anything what God was trying to explain by sending his son, Jesus Christ for us, right? So Acts chapter 10, verse 11, a reminder, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. That, that big they is the important piece about that's not just only the chosen select or the 12 or the people who hung out around Jerusalem or looked a little bit more like Jesus or dressed like him or smelled a little bit more like him. But these, these Gentiles, these people who are Greeks, these people who are Romans, these people who are South Africans, these people who are uh, more Eurasia, I, they don't look and smell and, and dress just like Jesus did, but they are a they're, they're drawn into the message just as you and I have been drawn to this message. And so his argument, you know that what he's talking about here is, is that the grace of Jesus equals salvation. There's no more complicated algorithm involved here, right? You don't need to become culturally Jewish to be saved and neither do you need to become culturally Christian to be saved, right? Or, or American. <laughs> Sometimes people get that confused. It's not, not a matter of being American to be a Christian. Uh, that's a fallacy. Um, but believing in Christian values, they won't save you. It's Christian values will, will not necessarily save you alone. They're good things, mind you. I mean, there's value in it. But don't put your faith in Christian values. Put your faith in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so believing in Christ will save you, right? And neither do you need to do good works in order to be saved. And Paul actually addressed this in Galatians chapter 2. So here's a reminder. Paul and, 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 uh, and Peter are working in tandem together uh, about, you know, what do we need to do about faith? And so Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. He says, know that the person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> to have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, is there value in still living a moral life? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But that's not what saved you. When we talk about having an intimate, passionate relationship with God through Jesus Christ of the transformation world, that has to happen through relationship. And through that relationship, God will direct you, right? God will direct you about where he's calling you to do things, to do good, do, to do good deeds in his name. 
uh, and not despite his name, but to do the good things, right? And so Paul and Peter, they want to make it very clear that we're not saved by the works or the cultural identity, but by God's saving grace. And we're saved. And then we do good works as a kind of fruit of our salvation. That's probably a better description of it, about a fruit of our salvation. But God doesn't measure our good deeds or our bad deeds to see if our good deeds outweigh our our, our bad deeds. And if they do, then then you get to heaven, right? No, 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 that's not how it works at all. You know, St. Peter's is not sitting there at the gate uh, with a scale, you know, I'll put that on there. Oh, well, you did this, and, and you did this and this, and you gave your you gave to your church. Good job. That that, that doesn't that's not happening. That's that's in cartoons, right? And so sometimes what what we see in TV or cartoons and movies gets filtered into our faith, and and you have to be careful about what you let into your faith. Go back to the scripture and weigh it against it. Use your Wesleyan quadrilateral. Use your scripture, use your intelligence, use your, your faith and, and the history of the church and measure it out. I mean, let's be smart. God gave you a brain. Let's lose it, right? But that's not how it works. <clears throat> there is no karma. There is no good luck God. There's no magic penny that you rub that's going to make a uh, amount of difference in any of this. He just needs, you just need his blood, his blood that was poured wide open for our salvation. And we are not saved by cultural identity or by works or but by God's grace, God's grace will transform us. You know, in a boxing match, when they have the final knockout round, you know, when the, it really gets hot and heavy and somebody's really laying away at somebody, or at least it seems like that is in the movies that there's a the knockout coming on. Round three is kind of that layout moment here in chapter 15 of Acts. God always planned to save the Gentiles by faith. So we look at verses 12 through 21. It it really lays it out specifically for us. The crowd hears Peter and they go silent. Like, okay, we could argue with you, but we know we're wrong. (laughs) Have you ever had somebody argue for the sake of arguing, even though you and they both know that they're wrong, but they're not tired out yet and they still got some fight in them? Um, That's what's happening here in round three. And finally, people have said, yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you, you're right, Peter. We, uh, we done messed up. And sometimes we have to admit to our, our flaws and, uh, and allow God to uh, restore us and to rectify wrongs that have happened in the church. And we've seen terrible things happen in the church or things that were done in God's name, obviously not uh, God's plan, but we've heard people uh, throughout history stay, you know, state clearly, you know, God has led me to believe Da, 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 or fill in the blank, or some crazy cult, or I mean, just most inane things. But also within just our local churches, we know that our churches that have said things are like, no, like that. that you, <laughs> I've read the Bible. Like, are they reading the same Bible I'm reading? What? Why is this emphasis on this? This, I'm, I'm mind blown, right? And, and And you have been as well. So round three. God always planned to save the Gentiles by faith. And so here's Peter, Acts chapter 15. I'm going to read 13 to 17 to you again. When they finished, James spoke up. I know I just said I was going to read this, but I'm pausing already. This is James, the half brother of Jesus, who you never heard about in the Gospels because he didn't follow his brother. He was not an early follower of Jesus Christ. It wasn't until his death and resurrection that Jesus' own brother came around. And Jesus had family who did not support him. I mean, (laughs) talk about family traditions, right? I mean, even in Jesus' own family, it wasn't perfect. So when you hear people say like, well, the church shouldn't be like that. (laughs) Well, guess what? It is. It's messy. But here is James, one of the one of the leaders of the church now, and has been for quite a while, right? When they finished, James spoke up, brothers and sisters, right? He said, "Listen to me. Simon has described to us. This is Peter. Simon Peter has described to us how God first intervened to chose a people for His name from the Gentiles." Okay, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as written. Now, now James is going to start quoting Amos from the Old Testament. After this, I will return and rebuild David's, David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will build, and I will restore it. And that the rest of mankind, my, oh, 
17, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. I mean, this is, this is a done deal. It's a scripture. We can't argue with this, or you shouldn't. So James is quoting Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 12, if you want to read it. It says, God always planned to rebuild the entire kingdom from, from David, David's nations, the Israelites. And I, I, James is the most unlikely person to share this story. Just as, you know, Peter was an unlikely person. He was just a, he was just a, a fisherman. And, and Saul was a Pharisee who wanted to see the Christians killed. I mean, these are the most unlikely leaders who are leading fervently and, and leading with such the Holy Spirit has really, really called them and attuned them to how important this really is. And so he always planned to build the people of God through the Gentiles. And they too shall be called by my name. And that's astounding. That means it was always God's plan to create one people out of the Jews and non-Jews through faith in Jesus Christ. So obviously Jesus Christ is the absolute pipeline as the conduit to, to God. And there's no other path. Like, don't let Oprah tell you anything otherwise. Don't let anybody universal Unitarian tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody TV, TV quack tell you otherwise. It is only through Jesus Christ. Don't let a human being stand in the pathway to tell you that. If you want to be in righteous relationship with God, you have to write a check for X and this amount of money. And, and, then, and then God will hear you. Or if you leave and go to this place and, and do this thing and, and come back, then all, that's, that's not even remotely scriptural or true. But we hear it in the church over and over again. And so we don't have to go round for round with these people who are sharing lies. We should call it out and show some sunlight on it and let that disinfect these lies uh, that, that perpetrate in the church. But it's not the voice of the church. It's not what God has called us to do and be a part of. And so this is why in the last chapter of Galatians, Paul calls the church the Israel of God. This universal uh, uh, to all people. And uh, that's, that's, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. And also kind of scary and nerve wracking because there are other cultures and other people that well, sometimes I struggle with, or they they put an importance and values on things that I go, well, I, I wouldn't have said it that way, or I wouldn't have spent my money this way, or I would have put this here, or I, I you know, I would have, I would have switched this, or I, 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 I wouldn't have worn that. I wouldn't have ate that. I definitely would. I mean, but those are those are all things that are that are not important to the gospel. Uh, they are important to us as people and cultures, and we have. We have cultural differences. I mean, 10 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most divided hour in our time zone for the entire for the entire time of all time, right? 10 a.m. on Sunday when we go to church frequently. Uh, for those people who don't go to church, obviously there's that division. But even those people who go to church, we are clearly divided uh, and frequently by culture um, because we have preferences or we have uh, realities of things that we have put upon our values, but it's not scriptural. It's not God ordained, it's just our preference. And so, uh, but it's not the Christians who have become Jewish or American or, or Methodist or, or Wesleyan or whatever the case may be, but it's Jewish people who need to become Christians, fathers of Jesus Christ, that we all need to identify ourselves as Christians, not American Christians, not as Wesleyan Christians, but as Christians, Christians, period. And so who wins the battles of the believers? Do the Pharisees win or does Paul win? Well, it doesn't really matter. Grace wins. And, and Paul doesn't make that distinction either, and neither does Peter. To be saved, you don't need to become one cultural identity or another. You don't have to be uh, have your good deeds sought out and weighed out or bad deeds sought out and weighed out as well. And we can ask God to deliver us of our sins. I'm not minimizing that. We absolutely need to ask God to deliver us that we might turn away from our sins, be sanctified, and be one with God. And we, we, we don't want anything to deviate us from that relationship. You need to be forgiven by Jesus. Like That's paramount, right? Like That has to happen. That, that's not a negotiable. Um, 
And we want that to happen so we can have this relationship. So it's not just like a, a one moment experience. Although there are people who have one moment experience with Jesus and we're so thankful they had that because they can, can continue to have that relationship in eternity as well. So it's amazing how even at the end of the passage, God shows grace to the believing Pharisees who came for a circumcision party and didn't get one. <laughs> that, that everybody got grace. Everybody got grace. And James gets up and says that the Gentiles should abstain from things polluted by idols. Like, you, you shouldn't do that. We should, we should reserve ourselves. And from sexual immorality, yes, we, we shouldn't do that. We, we can't maintain a growing relationship with God if we have sin that's standing in the way from what has been strangled from blood. This is a reminder here in verse 20. But the non-Jews are to respect the Jewish customs, but understand that those things won't save them, which is why we do respect other cultures. Uh, and we, you know, some churches have Christmas trees in them and some churches don't or, or whatever the cultural uh, thing might be of a value. Um, but any, any value that a church has that's not God ordained, that becomes, that becomes satanic. Like that, that's, that's, that's not God honoring. Um, but it, but if it helps us have that relationship with God, then, then, then we should have that. And that, that brings great value to the relationship that you have with God. The non-Jews are respecting of all the cultures now. That, that's the understanding that the church has. So grace means receiving a gift that we don't deserve. And nobody deserved that. Nobody has earned that. We, we asked for it. And it was freely given to us, but we pay no price other than to give our lives, which that's, that's a pretty big cost, honestly. It's kind of a parallel that we struggle with, right? Like it doesn't cost anything, but it costs everything. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's absolutely worth the cost, right? And I, my question for you is, have you received it? Or have you continued to give it to God, the cost, the cost of your life, to be in a righteous relationship, to have his salvation to be part of our lives as well? Because it's a gift. And it's a gift worth giving over and over that it's not that I give my peace away and now I don't have my gift of salvation. Uh, I don't want to be selfish with that gift. I already have that gift and I can give it away again and again and again and again and again and again. And it doesn't do anything to devalue my salvation. It does not do anything to increase my salvation as well. But it does say something about my relationship with God that I could be so generous that something could regenerate so many times and have so much great value and there's no intrinsic value that comes along with it. I know I sometimes people wrestle with that, like, well, why, why would I do this? Or why would I make that sacrifice? Because somebody made that sacrifice for you. And that somebody is Jesus Christ, the son of God. The man who came and, and had a ministry for three years, teaching people and helping people understand to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I still maintain there's a lot of people who need to learn how to love themselves the way that God loves us. Absolutely. And, uh, and because of that, uh, that's how we, we live our lives accordingly then, right? Jesus loves you and forgives you of all your sins. Believe in him. Grace wins every 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 time would you pray with me heavenly father we thank you for the message that we have in, in, in the book of acts and there's there's even more to read in, in the uh the book of acts uh, but our, our study together has come to an end so we th we thank you for the time that we've had to read this together and study and we know there will be many more lessons that we have to learn and god we thank you for being patient with us and guiding and directing us we act, ask you to continue to send your holy spirit to nudge us to guide us, uh, if need be, grab a two by four and push us in, and uh, and uh, uh, use a fulcrum and push us in a direction that we have to go. Uh, but we want our eyes to be open. We want our hearts to be full. We want our ears to be open. We want our minds to be open. We just want to experience you fully uh, anytime that we have the chance. And so uh, fill us Holy Spirit that we might be guided and directed by you. And that when people would see us, they might be, uh, they just might be interested and inclined to ask us about what is it that you have in your life 
that you uh, that you exude, that you seem to have this lightness to you. And uh, we could say with uh, passion and we can say with certainty that it's you, Lord, that that's why our life is different. And we can offer that to other people too. Uh, we can offer you, Jesus Christ, to other people, their lives might be changed and maintained, uh, uh, but, but, but changed as a result of, of what you called us to do and be a part of. Uh, it's just amazing the relationship that you offer to us, God. And we don't want to take it for granted. We just want to experience today and all the days to come. And so uh, thank you for using us and thank you for allowing us to be a part of your creation and your plan uh, to be with you in eternity. We look forward to that day, but we're so thankful for the day that we have now. And so we don't wish our lives away. Uh, we thank you for what we have. And so we thank you for all these things. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. And I-